I'll boom out. Y'all can hear me, right? Yes. I can wake y'all up, right? Yes. Good. Yes. Well, I have a couple of announcements this evening. Uh, speaking of announcements, uh, what, what is our gift announcement? Or do you want to try to make that? It's okay, I don't either. Um, the program that the, um, the church puts together to teach us a little more about the faith, and it's, and it's for Catholics to come to, and you know, we also can come. And, um, <laughs> and it's, it's either breakfast on Sunday at 11, and it lasts a little longer than it would take you to make it to the phone to go to the math or mother math, and it's 11. Or if you'd rather have one on Wednesday night for the Thanksgiving feast, I probably did if you want to do that. And um, apparently it's just dinner is kind of a lecture about being a family, being Catholic. And um, all you need to do is call the church office and let them know that you're going to be doing it. That's Sunday at 11 or Wednesday evening. I'm not sure which time. I want to say 5.30, but it really might be long. Just call off the church office. Can I grab a sheet of paper there for me? It's Sunday and next Wednesday. So, the ninth Wednesday and Sunday is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Well, I was about to roll out and, uh, and get the board there, but the board is blocked in, so I'm ad-libbing here. So I'll use this a little bit later. <clears throat> all right, uh, a couple of announcements of my own. First of all, I don't have a migraine tonight. So just watch out. The other announcement is, I'm still ugly. Sorry, you out there in TV land. I've got a face made for radio. So Turn off your monitors quick. Save your eyes. All right. Potluck for next Thursday. What? Next Thursday, potluck. Potluck next Thursday, probably at 6.30, am I guessing right about that? 6.30, potluck. All right. So, <clears throat> smoke pot and you're out of luck. Okay, well. Six. Six. Yes. Did I just say six, six, six? <laughs> Hell and all that. All right. Uh, tonight, uh, we are talking about, or actually more like, probably, I'm talking, oh, thank you, thank you, yes, let me see now, how do I do this? <laughs> huh. I want you to meditate on that for a little while. You're all good Bible-believing Christians, aren't you? This is going to be a philosophy lecture. <laughs> you got a problem with that? <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm going to be talking about... Uh, we don't get to that till the end, so you'll probably all be staring at that for the rest of the evening. Um, yes. Um, hmm. uh, I'm talking about tonight the four marks of the church. Uh, I asked Mark Ehrman which one he was. Uh, he's certainly not holy. Um, he's probably, he's not apostolic, he's, he's one singular sensation, every little step he takes, dun, 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 dun. one thrilling combination, every move that he makes, sorry, okay, told you, no migraine. All right, the four marks of the church, who would like to raise his or her hand and tell me what he said four marks are? Oh, that was easy. One, yeah. Holy. Holy. Catholic. Catholic and apostolic, yes. 
Uh, you find these at the end of the Nicene Creed. I believe one holy Catholic one holy Catholic apostolic church. I'm now on about my fifth version of the Nicene Creed. You've got to forgive me. And then when you throw in the Apostles' Creed, that's about eight different versions of two very similar creeds. So I always end up jumping lines. I've, I've seen priests lose track sometimes. It's, just, it's, it's hard sometimes. Um, and just for fun, and because I have a perverse sense of humor, we're going to start at the end and work our way back. So I'm going to talk about apostolic first, um, and then Catholic, and then Holy, and then One. Uh, it doesn't really matter because I found when I was putting this together that you keep on coming up, uh, you, you keep coming over to, back to the same issues, the same points. They are they're so tightly interrelated. And so I'm going to be repeating myself some and making allusions back to things. And so, uh, as Mr. Darwin said, jump in where you can and hang on. So, an apostolic church. Now, I believe I've talked somewhat about this before. Sorry. I feel like Colonel Taylor in the airplane. Oh, we are getting old, aren't we? Did anybody get that one? Did anybody get that? Please. Maxwell Taylor? No, Charlton Heston. Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Nothing. You know, the apes asked him, besides, even if you could fly, where would it get you? And he was busily making a paper airplane. Yeah, okay. Somebody got it. All right. There we go. Planet of the Apes, incredible commentary on American civilization, 1968, which has nothing to do with apostolic. <laughs> Of course, Mark Twain once said that if you look at the progression of presidents from Lincoln to McKinley, you have evidence right there that's enough to upset the theories of Charles Darwin. <laughs> apostolic. I have talked about the idea of apostolic succession. Uh, we're going to get back into that a little bit tonight, uh, as well as a few other things. Uh, the basic thing to remember when we're talking about apostolic is remember that Christ did not write a Bible, he did not write a New Testament. What he did was to put together an organization called an ecclesia, a church. I'm not sure what it would have been called in Aramaic, actually. Uh, it was written ecclesia in Greek for gathering, for church. Uh, and that from the very beginning, uh, if, you, if you look at the earliest letters of the church fathers, if you look at what's written in the New Testament, you see that the church has a human organizational structure. And that's inherent in what the church is. Uh, it was not until much, much later, uh, perhaps as late as the time of the Reformers, when you get the idea of the church as, as a, uh, what's the word, an inchoate group of believers, uh, wherever they are, uh, without the need for, for a human institution, a visible institution and a visible hierarchy. And that hierarchy, uh, too, is an important thing. Uh, so let's take a look at this, uh, at this institution a little bit. And going back to a president a little bit before Lincoln, and I meant to look this up today and I didn't, I believe it was Zachary Taylor who... How do you know? I know he's president. I also know he's Jefferson Davis's father-in-law. But is this story I'm about to tell about Zachary Taylor? I think it is. The Taylor uh, died, I think, in either late 1849, early 1850. Uh, had been elected president in 1848, and uh, they believe that it was a, some sort of intestinal problem. The the reason they gave is that it was a very hot day, and he ate cold milk and cherries, and he seized up and died. Maybe something was wrong with the milk. Nobody needs to know. Uh, I believe it was with Taylor that there was a story going around because he died at a very crucial moment in American history. He was opposed to this very important political compromise called the Compromise of 1850. Uh, take my Civil War course sometime. It's, uh, it's probably one of the most crucial uh, compromises in American history. Led to a lot of bad things. Kept the country together for another 10 years. But Taylor said he was going to veto it. And so, shortly after he said that, he died. Hmm, coincidence? 
We don't know. So people had floated this idea for, for decades that maybe somebody had had him offed. Well, when I was, I believe, a graduate student, I think this happened in, sometime in the late 80s, somebody won permission to, uh, to exhume him and to do forensic tests. Uh, because with some things like arsenic, you know, the evidence is going to stay there. And I remember seeing a videotape. They went to wherever it was that uh, Zachary Taylor was buried. Uh, they put out a United States Honor Guard, dress blues, full thing, as they exhumed him, took him to the lab, tested him, and then reburied him. Uh, found out there was no foul play as far as they could tell. Now, what do you find interesting about that story? The, I, I'm wondering if it's the thing that I found fascinating. What did Garfield? No, it was not Garfield. He was shot. Uh, that would have been 81. Uh, that was pretty clear. Was there a over there? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. So. The concept of the honor guard. <clears throat> what on earth would Zachary, Ta would Zachary Taylor even recognize the United States today if he came back? No. I mean, nuclear weapons and the vast uh, organization of the great society and welfare states and social security and a million, two million men under arms. And, hmm? Yeah, could be. All right. And yet, he is still recognized as the President of the United States. That the institution, the thing we call the United States, even though, if you look at it at first glance today, is a vastly different thing from what it was in 1850, or 1776, or even 1607, in, in the fundamental sense, it's still there. You get the same thing with this apostolic church, a church that is not only built on the apostolic office and apostolic authority and the faith of the apostles, uh, but it, it's grown throughout history. Uh, think of it as the mustard seed. You know, the mustard seed, smallest of seeds, if it dies, it grows into a huge plant. So if you expect the church of the early 21st century to resemble in its details, in its first impression, the church of the first century, then what you're logically expecting to see is one great big old mustard seed sitting there, right? It doesn't work that way. Uh, that if you look at how the United States organically grows, you see how what we have today is what we had 200 years ago, vastly changed. Uh, in some ways, some of its political principles actually contradict, I think, what it had at the beginning. Now, you don't find that in the Catholic Church because the United States government, the United States Constitution, and the United States Supreme Court are not infallible, unlike the church. But I think my point is taken, that you can trace the faith of the apostles, the organization of the apostles, all the way back to the beginning. And what is that early structure we got? Well, I will give you visual aids. Now, please, ooh, was that an expensive mic? Um, I was doing this at 3 o'clock in the morning, so if there are problems, please be gentle with me. Mr. Jeff, would you mind? Thank you. Praying for salvation from this horrible lecture. Yeah. Um, I think I've got 35 of them here, so uh, I think we can get it all the way around if team members do not take a copy. And then if there are any copies left, team members jump in. Oh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> We're going to look at the structure of the church as we have it today. In its fundamentals, uh, it's, it's what you read about in the New Testament. Uh, it's a little more elaborate now. Uh, it has a, a couple of extra parts to it, but at its core, same thing. Zachary Taylor gets the honor guard. I'm going to feel really stupid if it was William Henry Harrison, I've got to tell you, after saying this all the time. Thank you. Yes, so, old Tippecanoe. So, you know, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too? Yeah, they called, you know, William Henry Harrison, old, old Tippecanoe. And the best that the opposition could do, Martin Van Buren was up against him. Uh, Richard Mentor Johnson was the uh, vice presidential candidate. And all they could, the, the only counterpoint they could come up with, rumpsy-dumpsy, Colonel Johnson killed Tecumseh. 
Which he did, but you know, it's just not a very inspiring. I mean, I would have had to vote for Harrison in the Battle of the Forms. All right, uh, look first on the left side of this chart. Uh, everything to the left of the big black line. Uh, we're talking about ordained clergy. We're talking about the sacrament of holy orders. And uh, we see these listed and discussed, uh, sometimes explicitly, sometimes by inference in the New Testament. Uh, bishops are the highest order of holy orders. There isn't anything higher. And then one step down you have priests, and then a step down from that, you have deacons. Now, by stepping down, I don't mean to insult any deacons that we have out there, um, that the foot soldiers always do most of the work. Uh, but in terms of the fullness of priesthood and the ability to celebrate the sacraments, it's first bishops, then priests, and then deacons. Uh, bishops, the Greek word, uh, is episkopoi, which literally means overseer. Uh, to, to oversee, to supervise, if you will. The first bishops were, in fact, the disciples once Christ commissioned them and, and made them into apostles and sent them out. I think you can perhaps even uh, make an argument that they were uh, ordained uh, at the time of the Last Supper. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when we get closer to Easter and we get closer to Holy Week, uh, you will find that Holy Thursday, some of you may know it as Maundy Thursday, but it's usually called Holy Thursday in the Catholic Church, uh, is, is the priest's special celebration. It's their special night because that's when they mark the beginning of the priesthood, uh, when they are told to be a sacrificing priesthood and to uh, celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, the bishops were the seat of authority, and the most important seat was a particular bishop, St. Peter. And even if you're Protestant, you look at the Bible and you can see it's Peter, Peter, Peter. He is always first and foremost. Not because he's the most brilliant, not because he gets it, not because he's probably the most dashing, not even because he's the most faithful. You remember that little story about him denying Christ three times? Yeah, running away. Damn it, I don't know the man. Hmm. Strong words to say, huh? And, and, and he says that. He said, with a curse. I do not know him. Um, but because Christ picked him. He's the one. So uh, where Peter is, there is the church. And as the apostles died uh, or spread out, they elected or selected, actually, to the very beginning, elected more bishops. They elected Matthias to take the place of Bishop Judas. Yeah, Bishop Judas, interesting way of thinking about it, isn't it? Uh, so the elections continued all the way down to the present day. Now, the first and foremost of the bishops is the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome, because tradition tells us that Peter, uh, as well as Paul, went to Rome, and Peter made that his seat, the, uh, the seat of the entire empire, and therefore whoever succeeded him would be in that same place. And so the Bishop of Rome, that is... Uh, that is one of the official titles of the Pope. I do not believe Pope is an official title. Uh, can anybody correct me on that? I mean, I, it's certainly a very well-known title. Uh, he, but, but one of the official titles, probably the most important official title, is the Bishop of Rome. Uh, but, but there's no... He's, he's still just a bishop. There's no fourth order of ordained something or other up there. Yes? I was curious. I mean, you say that Pope is an official title. What about what they refer to as the papacy? Is that not from the word pope? It is. It is. Then you say it's not official. I mean, you're confused. Yeah. Well, pope, pope is uh, is is more of a shorthand. I mean, it really comes to pope. Really means papa. Uh, the Holy Father is what he is always referred to. But it's I won't say nickname, but it, it's not it's not a title, if you will. Um, but what he is, is the successor of Peter, the first and foremost of the apostles, the bishop of Rome, the patriarch of the West. I mean, there are many titles as to what he is, but Pope is more of a shorthand. So, uh, but, but it's not an actual title. Yes? Can I ask a question? No. Fire away. 
I just love, you notice how I interrupted you as well, in addition to being rude. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I always thought that there was the Pope, uh -huh. and then there was the Cardinal, yes. and then there was the Archbishop, which were all above a bishop. Mm -hmm. But according to your literature, they're all bishops, but they do have a higher standing, don't they? Yes, yeah, so you, you might call it, in the, let's, let's go to the Archbishop as well, since you mentioned that. Um, uh, with the Archbishop, it's more of an administrative role. Uh, there is no holy order called Archbishop. It's simply a bishop. Uh, an Archbishop, the, the difference is that an Archbishop oversees not just his own diocese, but in some administrative ways, neighboring dioceses as well. So we are here in the Diocese of Savannah, and that is overseen by a bishop. Uh, we have a new bishop, Gregory Hartmeyer, I believe I got the last name correctly. Um, now, he is, for most purposes, the final authority in the Diocese of Savannah. Uh, you, can, you can say in some ways that the Diocese of Savannah is its own church. It's interesting. You can, in Catholicism, you can use the word church to mean different things. You can mean it to use the building. You can use it colloquially to mean this parish, this congregation. Which church do you go to? I go to St. Joseph or I go to St. Peter Claver. Uh, you can use it to refer to the entire Diocese of Savannah. And, uh, and Bishop Hartmeyer is the ruler of, or the ordinary, of that church. And then, of course, all of these churches in communion with each other through the Pope are the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So that's kind of confusing. Well, in Atlanta, which is a, the other diocese in Georgia, uh, the Diocese of Atlanta is not the Diocese of Atlanta, it is the Archdiocese of Atlanta. And the bishop there, uh, he, he has no higher uh, status of sanctity, if you will, than Bishop Hartmeyer. What he does have is a sort of administrative oversight of the dioceses of Savannah, I believe of Charleston, of Raleigh, and of Charlotte. And there may be others. And so that means that now and then all of these bishops meet. The Archbishop of Atlanta meets with uh, the bishops of Savannah and Charleston and Raleigh and Charlotte. And uh, when they get together, the Archbishop of Atlanta gets to speak first and in terms of some administrative matters, uh, gets to say, you know, this is the way we're going to do it. Yes? Okay. Now, then, when uh, the bishop was being ordained, yes. then next to Tuesday, uh, when they called the College of the Bishop, would that have included the Archbishop and the Cardinals and all that? Yes. The College of Bishops, and forgive me for not putting that on there, but I, I, I believe in keeping things to one sheet, if possible. There are several things I wanted to put on here, but just couldn't. Uh, look at the word college. It comes from collegial or colleague. Uh, it means getting along with and working together to some common purpose. So the College of Bishops, not the College of Cardinals, we'll talk about that later. Good question, by the way, about Cardinals and back. Uh, the College of Bishops include every bishop in the world. That includes bishops, it includes archbishops, it includes the Bishop of Rome. Uh, so. Uh, now, there's a question. Once you're ordained a bishop, uh, you may not be given a diocese. You may not be given a, a particular, uh, a particular uh, uh, administrative or canonical role to oversee. What about Bishop Boland, Kevin J. Boland, who has just retired uh, as our bishop? He is still a bishop. Once you have been ordained, uh, it, it works a, a change, an ontological change in your very soul. Just exactly the same way uh, that it happens when you were baptized. Once you're baptized, you cannot be unbaptized. That mark is on your soul forever. Uh, likewise, when you're ordained a deacon, you're always going to bear that mark. When you're ordained a priest, you're always going to bear that mark. When you're a bishop, you're always going to bear, bear that mark. Even once you have retired and no longer administer or oversee a diocese. Um, so. Is this making sense so far? Very well. So the Bishop of Rome is one of the College of Bishops. What about the priest? 
that uh, that marry. Hmm? Priests that marry, yes. All right. What happens if you have a priest and he says, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm not getting it anymore. I don't believe in the church. I've uh, fallen in love. I want to marry, and he is laicized, and that's the word. He's laicized. A lot of people refer that to being defrocked. Um, he is still a priest. Uh, I believe it's the book of Hebrews. Thou art a priest forever. Uh, you're a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Um, in an emergency. He could still absolve, for instance, because he's still a priest. Now, he's been relieved from all priestly duties by his laicization. Uh, he is not to exercise that ministry uh, at all, uh, but in an emergency he can do it, and he probably should do it. But he's still a priest. Uh, he's, he's no longer an active ministry, but you can't undo that mark. You can't rub it off. Okay, so, so much for the bishops. Now, the bishops were, in fact, the centers of the early church. Uh, they made their headquarters uh, in the bigger cities. Uh, these cities were very important throughout the empire. By the way, anybody know what the word pagan means, etymologically, quite literally? Godless? No, country folks. Really? Yeah, because where were the bishops? Where, where did the church first spread? In the cities, because... You know, you had a higher target population there. It was easier to, to stay close to the bishop, to stay close to the church. Um, you know, those, those were big Catholic populations. So the, the heathen, those who had not yet become Christian, uh, the, the percentage tended to go up the farther out from the cities you got. So, so the word pagan uh, or non-Christian meant the folks out there in the country. Uh, it's very interesting that if you look at uh, if you look at the gypsies or the Romani or the Romani are one tribe of gypsies if you look at their language uh, their word for non-gypsies is civilians and that indicates that they got started as a military caste and so it works pretty much the same way, that the word adopts, it has a different meaning once you start getting into the root of it. Uh, very interesting stuff. I can tell you a few things about benefit of clergy, because uh, everybody gets that one wrong, or rule of thumb, uh, but no time, doggone it. Uh, so, moving right along. Well, the bishops can't be everywhere, and especially as the Christian communities grew. So, the bishop picked assistants and ordained them. And these people were called the presbyterate, presbyter, it's all Greek to me, um, and the presbyter or presider or elder or priest is the assistant to the bishop. Now as the assistant to the bishop, uh, the priest can carry out certain uh, sacramentary functions. Uh, he can baptize, uh, he can witness marriages, he can confect the Eucharist, he can hear confessions and absolve in the name of the bishop, but he's essentially the delegate of the bishop. Uh, one thing that the priest cannot do is to ordain. Uh, I believe that is, that is the one sacrament that a priest may never, uh, uh, may never carry out for himself. And so in that sense, a priest is, if you think about it, a sterile mule. Uh, he can result from the bishop, but he himself cannot create more of his sort. Um, so that's the, the one sacramental function that the priest can't do. Uh, the priest rarely, in some, in some circumstances, can, uh, can confirm. Uh, he can uh, carry out the, uh, the sacrament of confirmation, but only in certain circumstances. Um, and I forget exactly when it is, but it's, uh, one good example will be for those of you Christians who do in fact decide to come into full communion with the church, you will be confirmed by Father MacDonald uh, at the Easter Vigil. Because in that, in that circumstance, when you have Christians or, or unbaptized coming, adults coming into the church on the vigil, the bishop has essentially delegated his authority to confirm to the priest in that case. So, uh, so those are the two sacraments that uh, 
that the priest either has no authority to confer or limited authority in the case of confirmation. Yes. So does that mean the bishop has to come whenever the nine creators get confirmed? Yes, and he does. Uh, the bishop usually makes the rounds, and there's probably a diocesan schedule because this is this church belongs to the bishop of Savannah. Father McDonald is just his agent here to make it run on a daily basis. If that's the way of thinking about it. Okay. Other questions so far about priests? Yes. Mm. Yeah, they're on the right side. We're going we're gonna to work our way down to the bottom of the left, and then we will uh, head over to the right. But yeah, good question. What about Monsignor? Monsignor is, yes, my, my, my lord is literally what it means. My sir or my lord. Um, if you ever hear the liturgy in Latin, uh, whenever they talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, he's Señor Jesus Christ. Because what does Señor mean? It means the same thing as Monsignor, which means my lord. Good sir, sire, father. Uh, wonderful to trace all this language, isn't it? Um, and Monsignor is an honorific. It's, once again, not a higher, it, it's not a fourth holy uh, level of holy orders. Uh, it is usually awarded to priests of long service, of distinguished service. And there are different ranks of Monsignor. Can anybody help me out with that one? Yeah, I can't remember how, how it works, but I think there are two or three different ranks. And you can tell based on, uh, not, the, not the Beretta, but, yeah, yeah, you can tell what, what order they're in. So um, it, it's, it's pretty much an honorific, uh, sort of like Professor Emeritus, if you will. Yeah, very good, but good question, excellent question. Okay, other questions about priests? Now I come to the deacons. The diaconoi, or the diaconos, I guess, is the singular. Uh, and uh, that means servant. Uh, the problem is that the bishops and priests in the book of Acts were, were so busy running around feeding the poor and, and helping people that they didn't have enough time to preach and they didn't have enough time to celebrate the sacraments. They said, we need more help. You know, talk to HR. We've got to open up some new budget lines here, get some new people in here because we're running ourselves crazy. All right, and these helpers are going to be designated to, to ministering in the community, to feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, visiting people in prison, which will leave priests freer to preach the gospel and to baptize and to celebrate the sacraments. And uh, you can read about that. It's, uh, very clear story of how the deacons came about. Uh, now, I think it's interesting because uh, what's the first thing that we do to deacons today? We give them the book of the Gospels and say, good, you can preach for us now. Wait a minute. We thought you were making us deacons so you would have time to preach. Yeah, well, these things change. Uh, there are actually, and I did not have time to, or, or space to put into it, put much on this chart. Uh, today, there are actually two different types of diaconoi or deacon. Uh, there are transitional deacons and permanent deacons. Over time, uh, the, the diaconate evolved into what you might call priest in training. And that was what we today call a transitional deacon. And so for, for most of the past several hundred years, uh, if not thousand plus years, uh, what the deacons became uh, were, were priests in training. And especially since we got seminary training after around 1500, uh, what would happen is a, uh, uh, a seminarian would study, he'd work, he'd learn about the things he'd need to know in order to be a priest, and then uh, for a time before he became a priest, today it's about a year, it's not set in stone, uh, he would in fact be ordained a deacon. And that would give him the, uh, both the responsibility and the freedom to get some hands-on training. Uh, and uh, he would preach, uh, and you can also baptize as a, as a deacon. It's interesting to uh, to think about this, uh, and this is going to be true of permanent deacons as well, that the two sacraments that the deacon is most often associated with um, are baptizing 
and officiating at weddings. Uh, you, you don't see that a lot, especially where you've got, uh, got a fair number of priests, but they can do that. Now, that's interesting because uh, anybody can baptize in an emergency. You do not need holy orders to do that. Uh, I find somebody here, he's by the side of the road, he's dying, it's going to do anything for you. Well, I was going to be received into the church, but I think I'm dying, what can I do? Well, I can throw water on him and I can baptize him. Perfectly valid baptism. Uh, that is why the Catholic Church recognizes most Protestant baptisms, uh, as long as they're done in the proper form, of the proper race of the sacrament. Uh, also, who confers the sacrament in any Christian wedding? The bride and the groom confer it on each other. The priest is not conferring a sacrament there. He is simply there as the official church witness. And therefore, a deacon can do that as well. Uh, so you're not really giving the deacons much that, uh, in terms of sacramental authority that laypersons don't already have. It's, for the transitional deacons, it's mainly a training process for them. They may get assigned to a parish uh, and, and this sort of thing. The permanent diaconate has just recently been restored. We've been getting a little bit back to our roots there. Uh, and these are uh, married men who have, in fact, studied, uh, who have, in fact, prepared for a life of ministry and service to the poor, the hungry, the community at large. Uh, and we, in fact, uh, have, is it, we have two or three of them. Yeah, we have two right now, I can't think, assigned to, to St. Joseph. Uh, they are married. Now, their wives have to agree to them going in this ministry. They have to be very supportive. Uh, I do not believe these permanent deacons can marry again uh, if their wives predecease them. And they are not on a track to be priests. Uh, I do not think that our permanent deacons could, in fact, become priests, once again, unless their wives predecease them, uh, because uh, it's, it's just a, a different animal. So. Uh, 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 Don Coates and Tom Eden are our two permanent deacons uh, here at St. Joseph. Okay, questions about holy orders? Yes. I noticed you have the arrows for the deacons going right from the bishop as opposed to coming from the priest. Yes, okay. because the, yeah, the deacons are a, a different type of assistant to the bishop, but it's an assistant to the bishop, not assistant to the priest. And once again, a way of thinking about this, a priest cannot ordain a deacon. That ordination comes from the bishop. So all, all, all priests and all deacons are delegates of or assistants to the bishop. The bishop is the ordinary of this diocese. He is the one who teaches, who rules, and who sanctifies. And the priests and deacons are just simply helping him do that. Yes? What if the deacon wants to move? Uh, that's, that's usually, well, if it's a permanent deacon, that's pretty easy because uh, permanent deacons are usually not full-time employees of the church. They can be, but usually they have lives outside the church and they're volunteering their time, and they are not going to be held to that same degree of stability uh, that, that priests are. So, um, so they can move. We had, uh, uh, and that's why I was hesitating, because we have had two permanent deacons associated with St. Joseph in the last three years who have, in fact, moved away. One moved, uh, uh, one moved to uh, Tybee, and I actually think that the bishop asked him to go there. And then we had another who moved to Florida who went of his own volition, but I think he had to get permission of the bishop. So. My guess would be, and, and I'm saying this provisionally, I, I don't know for certain, that if you wish to be a permanent deacon and you are not married and you are in fact ordained as a permanent deacon, I'm not sure you can remarry. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah. And, and once again, I think, that, I think that's true in, in the Latin rite anywhere, that uh, on the rare occasion that you have a married priest, if his wife predeceases him, he may not remarry. On the rare occasion that you have a married priest, he is not eligible to be a bishop. I do not believe a bishop can ever be married under any circumstance. He's married to the church. So, 
Yes, in back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That is, uh, and that's that is particularly what I had in mind when I was talking about the rare occasion of a married priest. Uh, you will usually find this with Episcopalian or Anglican former Episcopalian or Anglican ministers, and probably Lutherans as well, because they're. Uh, their understanding of the liturgy and of a lot of aspects of theology are so similar to the Catholic Church. Uh, you can make a good argument that, uh, that with the Anglicans especially, what you've got is, is really almost a difference in right. It is almost, and I, I stress that word almost, like uh, Anglicans are in the same relation to the Catholic Church as the Orthodox are. Now they are not. Uh, there is a uh, there is a major impediment to that. But they, if you will, know the lingo. They know the idea. So uh, certainly their holy orders will not be recognized as valid. But they're close enough that they can be ordained as Catholic priests. And you know they don't divorce their wives when they do that. Uh, so they they bring their wives, they bring their families with them. But if their wives predecease them, then they may not remarry. Um, I don't know. Good question. The question is, can a married priest be a pastor? Um, I think he can, but once again, I'm just guessing. I, it seems to me that I've heard of one or two, um, but I may not be sure. That, you know, maybe a parochial vicar. I, uh, I remember, I think it's Dwight Longnecker, uh, who is, a, if, once again, if I'm remembering the right name, who was an Anglican minister and then was ordained a Catholic priest and he was assigned to a parish. It may not have been his pastor, it may have been a parochial vicar and he stood up at the morning mass and said, you know, at the announcement and said, well, I'm, I'm your new parochial vicar, my name is Dwight Longbecker and he's, these are my wife and children. I'm, I'm Father Dwight and, you know, in a Catholic church is like, ooh, okay, cognitive dissonance. So, a uh, hand over here somewhere? Yes. Do deacons hold jobs outside the church? Yes, they do. Uh, once again, permanent deacons. A transitional deacon is still probably going to be in his fourth year of seminary or final year of seminary. If not, then he's working in the parish. So, okay, moving right along because we're still on apostolic here, but that, but that's that's okay. It's one of the two big subjects, uh, Catholic and and holy. I can get through pretty quickly. All right, we're moving on now to the right of the chart, and uh, s several questions have always have already bubbled up about this. Uh, we'll start with the biggie, cardinal, because a lot of people would probably think that cardinal is, is that mysterious fourth holy order that I've been alluding to all night. It is not. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a position within the church uh, that is usually held by bishops. Doesn't have to be. Uh, occasionally you will find a priest or even a deacon uh, who is in the College of Cardinals. And I believe that even laymen can be in the College of Cardinals. I'm not sure if it's happened recently or even at all, but it's, it's technically possible. So what is a cardinal? Uh, well, a cardinal is a prince of the church. Uh, remember that you've got a very strong medieval overlay in the Catholic Church. Uh, of course, you've got a very strong medieval overlay uh, in any university you walk into. I say that in defense against somebody who always accuses the Catholic Church of being, oh, it's so medieval. Oh well, yeah, the medieval world gave us, uh, gave us the scientific method, it gave us the Gothic cathedral, it uh, gave us the university. I'd take that as quite a compliment. Um, so, so yes, there are, it's in effect a title of nobility uh, of the church. It's largely an honorific. Uh, it is often given to very eminent bishops or other members of the church. Uh, it's it has got different ranks within it, and this, is, this gets kind of complicated because you have cardinal deacons, cardinal priests, and cardinal bishops. So you can have a bishop who is named a cardinal deacon. Clear as mud, right? Yeah. So, um, but the main job of the cardinal is, or the College of Cardinals collectively, is to get together when needed and elect a new pope. Uh, just like the bishops elected uh, 
a Bishop Matthias back in the book of Acts. Uh, that's when they really come to the public eye. Uh, so, yes? How are, bishop, how are bishops elected? They are, uh, they're not really elected so much as chosen, and it's actually a fairly obscure process that uh, the Vatican has a representative in the United States, the papal nuncio, uh, he's, he's essentially an ambassador of sorts to the United States. And he is going to receive information from bishops and maybe from priests about, uh, about men that uh, peers believe would make for a good bishop, uh, would make for a good priest. And he carries out an investigation. He forwards his recommendation to the Vatican. Uh, and, and the Pope is ultimately the one who at least nominally decides. Uh, it's kind of a closed process. Yes. Same question, only for cardinals. Mm -hmm. the, I believe the cardinal is entirely up to the pope. Uh, and there's, once again, a cardinal is not that mysterious fourth degree of holy order. So there's not an ordination required. It's an administrative appointment. Uh, the, the pope says, guess what? Cardinal, you're it. Uh, Tony first, and then... Don't forget the cardinal nephew. Uh, hmm? oh. The cardinal nephew, don't forget that. Oh, yes. Okay, moving right along. So. <laughs> yeah. Ever since I was a kid, I've always known popes have been come from Europe. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a pope from any of the Americas? No. Uh, uh, um, I would think that. I would think there was, but I mean, like, you know, this is a huge population. Yes. Here. Yes, I think so. And I think you're going to see a pope from somewhere other than Europe in our lifetimes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a lot of discussion about 10 years ago, as John Paul was getting very old, of uh, Francis Cardinal Lorenzo, I think Francis was his first name, of Nigeria. Uh, that the, the, Christianity is very strong in Nigeria, not just Catholicism, but I think also a touch of Anglicanism, if I'm correctly. But Lorenzo is a very, uh, he, he, would, he, he is very, as they say, papable. Um, very orthodox, very charismatic. Um, as it turned out, Carl uh, uh, Ratzinger was chosen to be Benedict XVI, um, but, but Arenzi's name was very much floated. I don't think you'll ever see an American. Uh, there is so much Americanization in the world, I, I think there would just be sort of a reaction against that. Hmm? <laughs> oh, please. Dominus Vobiscum, y'all! Golly, I never thought I'd be made Pope. I've got to forgive them what they've done to me. I've got a hand over here. Yeah, but that can be changed. I mean, that's, uh, I don't know who changes. The bishops may have to vote on that. And if you're over 80, if you're a cardinal who is over the age of 80, you don't get to vote in the papal election. So, yeah. Uh, why can't women hold any of these? Um, you mean, are you talking about on the right or the left? Uh, any of them. <sighs> uh, I'm going to give you the quick and dirty version because there's, there's a lot for me to get through tonight. Um, the Mass is the wedding feast of the Lamb. Christ is marrying his bride, the church. I will refer those of you who know the hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Uh, he brought her to be his holy bride. And this is a fertile union. And who, who are the offspring of it? All of us. Okay, every time a soul is baptized, this is how you're brought into the church. Uh, she, she is properly referred to in the feminine as Holy Mother of the Church. Um, there's nothing sociologically wrong with having a female pastor, but interestingly enough, uh, Christ picked who he wanted. A lot of people say, well, you know, if Christ were alive in, 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 in today's society, and, you know, with today's social mores, of course he'd pick women. Well, no. Uh, Christ picked who he want, wanted. If you read about Christ's ministry, very much of it was upsetting the social mores of the day. All right? He was not constrained by social mores to picking men. And if he was going to ordain anyone, why not any woman, why not his own mother? He didn't. You know, she's very important, but she was not ordained. What happens if you have a female priest? The marriage is sterile by its very nature. You are going to find that Catholicism is shot through with sexuality. And 
It's, it's not the light, fun, Hollywood sexuality you see today. Sexuality are matters, is a matter of life and death, of bringing new souls into the world, of, of running risk of death in childbirth. Uh, when, when we play with sex in the Catholic Church, we're playing with live ammo. Uh, you know, this is why contraception is a very, very big no-no in the Catholic Church, because it, it sterilizes a marriage. Uh, this is why female priests, that, that, that sexuality, that the fact that you were born a man is an inherent part of your identity. It is not an accident of genetics. Well, there were some X sperm and there were some Y sperm and, you know, you just, it was luck of the draw. No, your, your carnality is an inherent part of your identity. Uh, and God recognizes that in different roles he's established. That's the short version. We'll probably be talking a lot more about that uh, later on. Yeah. Um, now, interestingly enough, one of the things that I could not put on this chart was, uh, on the right side of the chart, was that of consecrated virgin. Okay? Men cannot be consecrated virgins in the Catholic Church. Sorry, can't. That's reserved to women. So, but, but I want to be a consecrated virgin. She's getting to do it. Too bad, you're a guy. So it cuts both ways. Um, all right. Um, we're really going to have to, to us alone now. I've got about a half hour left. I'm gonna put, religious orders. <sighs> Travel, if you will, to the 300s. When, first of all, the Emperor Constantine sends out the Edict of Milan, okay, we'll start tolerating these Christians, uh, even though that they have never recognized the divinity of the Emperor. We'll start tolerating them. We'll quit killing them. And after a couple of back steps, you get uh, later on in the 4th century the decision that Christianity is going to be the only acceptable religion in the empire. It's going to become the official state religion. What happens at that point? Everybody rushes in to become a Christian because it's the fashionable thing to do. Maybe even it's the required thing to do. Uh, a lot of Protestants uh, who fall into the militant anti-Catholic core of Babylon camp say that this is when the church fell even though, of course, Christ said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. They brought their pagan ways into the church and paganized it. Um, as individuals, some of them probably did. Not to the doctrine. Uh, every doctrine that, that these militant anti-Catholics hate and revile, you will find exists before that moment. So yeah, it's not pagan. It, it exists in the very beginning of Christianity. Uh, but you did have a, a rush of people coming in. Uh, the church was now above board. It was open. And some people who desired a more contemplative life uh, wanted to, to get away from the hustle and bustle, if you will. They went into remote places, especially in the east. They went into the desert. They lived lives as hermits. And, of course, living a very holy life as a hermit Word's going to get around. Hey, there's a very holy hermit out there. And what's going to happen? Other people are going to move out to be with a very holy hermit, and suddenly he's not a hermit anymore. He's, he's got a little community with him. And, and as the lights of civilization then started going out, as, as the Germans came swamping in from the, from the east, uh, you found religious orders, these little religious communities, becoming very formalized. Uh, the rule of St. Benedict which was put out in the 400s, I believe, was the first rule to how to live in a community life like that. And suddenly you have a monastic order. Um, you have monks, and monk, even, even though monasticism applies to both men and women, the word monk, or monos, living alone, usually refers to men. And nuns, I actually don't know the etymology, etymology of that, uh, refer to communities of women. Now, with monks, uh, you, you can have them living solo, but much more often you have them living in communities. You have Benedictines, you have Franciscans, you have Cistercians, you have Cluniacs, you have Augustinians. They all have slightly different rules for their life. Generally, the big division is, are we going to get out in the community and bring the light into the world? Uh, best example that comes to mind immediately, Dominicans, you know, known as the great teachers of the faith for a thousand years now? Or are we really, really going to withdraw from the world, 
keep the world from corrupting us and turn our lives to prayer. And our ministry will be, for instance, uh, uh, to some poor Claire's do this, for instance. Their job is to pray for people 24-7, to pray for people who cannot or will not pray for themselves. So they too are serving the world, but they do it from behind the cloister walls. With men, with, uh, with male monastic communities, uh, some of the men may or may not be priests, as well as monks. That is not required. If you see a monk, if you happen to see a monk walking around in downtown Macon, um, maybe he's a priest, maybe he isn't. Um, you don't have to be a priest, you don't have to be a deacon or a bishop to be a monk. That being said, our new Bishop Hartmeyer is, I believe, a member of the OFM. Is he OFM? He's a Franciscan. Yes, the Order of Friars Minor. I claim my fourth. Yes, very well. Um, Yes, uh, for instance, the friars, the OFM, Order of Friars Minor, literally means the, the Order of the Little Brothers. Um, so you refer to them as brother. They don't even, you don't even technically refer to them as monks. You refer to them as brothers. So. What about Brother Vincent? That, yes, he, he, uh, he has actually taken simple vows. Uh, I think he took them at Conyers, but he is not a Trappist. He, is, uh, uh, you know, he lives his own little consecrated life on his own to my knowledge. So sometimes y'all see him wandering around often in white robes and a skull cap. Yeah. I was going to say, many, many brothers uh, usually exist in the different uh, communities. Mm -hmm. and they will do things like the, the, the cooking, uh, the garden work, yes. uh, support work, things like that. Right. So, yeah. Uh, someday I'll do a talk on monasticism and we can really spread it out and look at it, but we've really got to move on. And then last but actually not least, the laity. Because first of all, the laity is the biggest group. And secondly, it's the group from whom all of the other groups come. And that's very interesting. You know, sometimes a member of congregation will get up and say to the bishop, why won't you send us more priests? The bishop says, you send them to me. <laughs> all right. Uh, and the laity, uh, your, your vocations are to go out into the world, to live a Christ-like life in the world, to be seen to be living it, be the salt of the earth, uh, you know, bring, bring your Christian identity into the world. Okay, um, I'm going to move along. I will try to leave a little time for questions after this because we've got a lot of them. But I've got I've to the uh, hit the other things. Um, we good? Okay, we're rocking. All right, Catholic. Um, uh, Catholic. I'll try to be quick with this one. Uh, it is from a Greek adjective, katholikos. Uh, literally, it probably means all-encompassing, universal. It was, you will not find it in the Bible. Uh, it's older, in a way, than the canon of Scripture, because the canon of Scripture was not fixed for a little while. But uh, the word Catholic is applying to the Catholic Church. Uh, was first used around the year 106, uh, by St. Ignatius, who was Bishop of Antioch. Uh, he used it in a, a letter that he wrote to the Smyrnians, just like the apostles wrote letters that eventually became part of the New Testament. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch wrote letters to, to his flocks. Uh, he was warning them generally of heresy because people already were, uh, by then, getting the wrong ideas about what Jesus had taught and what he had accomplished. And sometimes they, uh, they embraced these wrong ideas militantly and refused the corrections of the bishops, who were the ones who knew best. Uh, so, you know, he, he warned people that, uh, well, I'll, read the, uh, I'll actually read the entire quotation. See that you all follow the bishop, even as Jesus Christ does the Father, and the presbytery, thank you, and the presbytery as you would the apostles and reverence the deacons as being the institution of God. Let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop. Let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he is entrusted, a priest. Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be, even as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. So you see this identification of Christ with his bishops, the bishops with his assistants, and all of these with the laity. Uh, Catholic can apply, it, it can mean many things. First of all, it means the whole of the faith. 
the fullness of the faith. And the faith that is, is presented to all the world. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. So uh, that's, that's very important. Uh, it, it refers to both the, the fullness of the teachings of the church as well as, as, a, as a faith that, that is for everybody. Now, uh, you will find that there are Protestants who say the Nicene Creed that talk about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Their understanding, and for that matter, I suppose the Orthodox understanding of Catholic is different from that of Catholics. You notice I don't use the word, when I'm talking very much, Roman Catholics. And that's because Roman Catholics is a Reformation term. And it's also a derogatory term. Uh, I've had good friends of mine, including one Presbyterian minister, who says, oh, you know, I'm a Catholic too. I'm just not a Roman Catholic. I'm a little C Catholic. Um, well, that's, that is a Reformation era Protestant redefining of this word. Uh, from the Roman Catholic perspective, there is no such thing as a little C Catholic. That's, that's, an, that's an innovation. That, that was an idea that didn't exist until about 500 years ago. Is that a hand wants to go up? Or, yeah, I'm sure you'll correct me if I get this wrong. Um, that, that that was a way to try to, to embrace, to own the word Catholic without having to submit to the Pope. No one had ever thought that or done that or believed that for 1,500 years of church. So that's one thing you need to understand that if you accept the Roman Catholic understanding of this, there are two things you need to remember. First of all, Roman Catholic is a slur on those who follow the Bishop of Rome. And secondly, there is no such thing as a little c Catholic. There's one thing called a Catholic Church, and it's got a visible hierarchy, and it's headed by Christ, run on earth by the Vicar of Christ, the Pope, and the bishops who are in communion with him. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the Lutherans kept actually I think mm -hmm. the Lutherans that kept Catholic. Yeah, most people do. The Yeah, um Anglicans do. And 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 that makes a lot of sense because once of all once again, how can you take an eighteen hundred year old creed and wrench a basic term out of that and have that creed mean the same thing? Of course a church is Christian. What is it? Muslim? Yeah, I, I believe in, in one holy Christian synagogue. I mean, it makes about that much sense. It, you know, it, it's stupid. So, um, anyway, all right. Uh, holy. Oh, a hand, yes. Yes. Well, it began, it, it began as a slur. John Kennedy is elected president. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, was everyone using that as a slur? No, no. It began as a slur. It began as a slur. It, it, people use it now without meaning to. Well, I'll give you an example. Have you ever been to a magic show? And they say, hocus pocus, fish bones choke us. Were you upset? Were, were you upset? Well, well, you should have been, because even though hocus pocus has now devolved into just sort of a fun, fun phrase that magicians use, it began as a slur on the holy sacrifice of the Mass. There is no such thing as the real presence. There is no such thing as transubstantiation. Those Roman Catholics just say a bunch of hocus pocus over it. And hocus pocus is a corruption of hoc est anum corpus meum est. This is my body. So you see, it, it originally was a horrible slur on the sacrifice of the Mass. You know, we don't get upset about it anymore because it's not used that way. But if you really study how the phrase Roman Catholic got started, yeah, it was used by Protestants to distinguish the horror of Babylon from the true faith of Protestantism. Well, because the feelings were very, very strong back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that word became Roman Catholic. Yes, but there's, there's no need to qualify it. It's simply Catholic. There's only one Catholic church. And the church is... You know, the church is headed on earth by the Pope and by the bishops in communion with him and by the laity who follow the teachings of the church. When, when did the uh, it, it would be during the Reformation. Yeah, 
1500s, early 1600s. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah other, other slurs would be uh, Romish. Yeah, you see that word thrown around a lot in the 1500s. Yeah, pap papist. Um, hmm? Hokey pokey. I never heard that one, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's let's settle down, folks. Please, please direct questions to me if you've got them. I'm hearing a lot of muttering. So. Yes. Well, once again, it today is not usually used as a derogatory term. Well, the the. No, the the branch theory was put forth by Anglicans. And the Anglicans said the Catholic Church subsists in three branches. The Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, and the Eastern Orthodox. To which the Catholic Church replies, there's only one Catholic Church. It is headed by the Pope and consists of the bishops and the laity who are in communion with him. But the, 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 the Pope, the, 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 the Bishop of Rome, yes. he's like the boss in, uh, of the boss of the Greek Orthodox and the Orthodox. Not according to the Catholics. He is the successor of St. Peter, who is the chief apostle, who has received the keys of the kingdom. Do they, do those two churches follow under his, uh, his umbrella, his, under his sphere of influence? Um, the, the Orthodox do not. They are, they are what are called schismatic. They do not accept the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Yes. Now, you have what are called Eastern Rite Catholics. If you go into one of their churches, it looks for all the world like Greek Orthodox or, or something like that. But it's only a liturgical difference. The bishops and priests in that church uh, are, uh, they follow, they are followers of the Bishop of Rome. But the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, all of the National Orthodox do not accept the authority of the Bishop of Rome over them. So they are in schism. They are not part of the Catholic Church. So, and once again, their use of the word Catholic is an innovation. So. Because I spoke with someone last night. Just a matter of fact, last night, mm -hmm. a friend of mine who was baptized here, by my father, when he was a father, when he was a regular priest, and, um, and he said, well, I was raised uh, Greek Catholic. And he's, I mean, I got mm -hmm. the, impression, the distinct impression mm -hmm. that he was under the impression that that he was uh, a regular Catholic, but just yeah. doing it in, 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 like a Greek version. Once again, for a thousand years, the Catholic Church meant, and if you ask a Catholic today, it still means the Pope and the bishops who are in communion with him. That the Orthodox, if they're using that way, and I know from personal experience, the Anglicans and, and, and other Protestants, they had to come up with novel, innovative understandings of the word Catholic to try to to, to try to make that word applicable to them that did not exist for at least a thousand years and is still not recognized as correct today by Catholics. Yeah. Yes. Now, once again, I would like to emphasize and get in the back. People today who use the words Roman Catholic usually do not mean it disparagingly. I'm telling you how the words began. And they began with the same derogatory meaning as Romish. Uh, you know, we're Catholics, but we're not the Roman Catholics. You know, we're, you know these people often believe that the, pap the papacy was the Antichrist. And so they had to distinguish themselves from Rome while remaining Catholics. They redefined the word. Uh, that redefinition is not something that Catholics go with. So, all right, I've really got to move along, and I will, I will once, once I get through the program, I will stay and answer questions as long as you want me to. Um, holy. Well, of course, all Catholics are holy, right? Yeah, Hitler, baptized Catholic, altar boy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As um, St. Augustine once said, how many wolves are in the fold, O Lord, and how many sheep are out of it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's holy for a couple of things. First of all, when something is holy, it is set aside for a special purpose. Uh, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. I'm setting you aside for these things. Uh, you are the leavening of the world. The church is for the sanctification of the world, to spread the gospel message, for the salvation of all who hear the message. Um, and that's what we mean when we say it is holy. Uh, Catholics have, sometimes in their official capacities, probably perpetrated just about every evil that it's possible to perpetrate. All right. 
You've got to remember, and, and the thing that I like is, is Christ human or is he divine? Is Christ human or is he divine? The answer, the answer is not even both. The answer is yes. He's 100% human and he's 100% God, and yet he is one person. All right? So the church is, by analogy, almost exactly the same thing. It is a human institution. It is made up of humans. Humans occupy every office that it's got but it's also divine. It was established, it was created by Christ, uh, it is guided by the Holy Spirit, and in those sense it is divine and therefore infallible and impeccable. But humans, you know, you get humans involved, they're gonna mess it up. Now the one thing that humans have never messed up about the Catholic Church, the only thing that humans have never messed up about the Catholic Church is the purity of its teachings in the areas of faith and morals. And once again, I'll remind you, the best way I ever heard it, that God loves his church so much, and he wants to reveal himself through that church so much to all of humanity, that if Satan incarnate were somehow elected pope, the Holy Spirit would prevent him from teaching doctrinal error. Okay? And that's the dividing line between Catholic and Protestant. Protestant says that the church can fall into error and has fallen into error. Catholic says, yeah, it sure has, but not doctrinally. Um, officials within the church have been anti-Semitic. They have committed sex crimes. They have violated vows of chastity, poverty, obedience, stability. Um, you know, they've done all sorts of things, but, they've, but God has never permitted them to teach error. So when you see evils being perpetrated by Catholics, that's because they, because of their human sinfulness, are not living out the faith the way that they should, which is perfectly. Be perfect the way your Father in Heaven is perfect. Uh, as a matter of fact, Catholic bishops have even executed Catholic saints. Joan of Arc. Yeah, so. Um, so when you, you got to understand what this holy means. It doesn't mean we're all perfect because we're not. All right, that brings us to one, uh, which I can try to cover in six minutes. <laughs> all right, Jesus himself prays you know, that they all may be one. And you can see a lot of this one reflected in what I've been covering so far. Uh, you know, that we're all one with the faith. We're in full communion with the Pope. We're in full communion with each other. We follow all the teachings of the church. Now, Protestants out there, a good, how many good Bible-believing, Bible-believing Protestants do we have out there tonight? Okay, what if somebody said, oh, yeah, well, you and I believe the basics. We're together on the basics. Now, of course, I don't accept the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of John, uh, but, you know, we believe the, the important stuff together. Yeah. You, know, we, we, you know, you're looking at me kind of funny. But, we, you know, you and I agree on the basics, but we do. Luke and John are not basic. Matter of fact, Acts isn't either. He was, you know, that was written by Luke. But we agree on the basics. You know, I'm, I'm a Christian just like you. What are the basics? Well, well, the things that we agree in together. Right. Oh, no, it isn't. It's, it's really not. As a matter of fact, some of it's wrong. But the basics we agree on. But we do. All right, he's the Catholic and I'm the Protestant. You know, this, this is something you often hear from Protestants. Well, yeah, you can be Catholic, and, you know, it's good that you, you know, have all that liturgy and stuff like that. You know, I don't believe that. You know, we in my church don't believe that, but we believe in the basics. You and I both believe in the basics, so we're both Christian. You know, what is a Catholic going to respond? No, you've lost some of the basics. And once again, that is the difference in Catholic and Protestant. Protestants believe that Catholics have added stuff to the faith that shouldn't be there. Catholics believe that Protestants have taken away vital aspects of it that didn't have to be there. So that, that uh, lowest common denominator argument is an argument you're going to hear from a Protestant, not from a Catholic. As a matter of fact, Protestants have removed books from the Bible. Uh, they call them the Apocrypha. We call them the Bible. So I, I'm trying to give you the Catholic perspective here. That from the very beginning, people who have said that they follow Christ and probably really do want to and believe they're following Christ have fallen into error. 
that error is called heresy. Let's get around the emotional charge of that because Protestants believe Catholics are heretics just like Catholics believe Protestants are heretics. Let's, let's put the emotional baggage aside, use it as a theological term. That Christ wants us to be one, one in faith, one in belief. Uh, people have fallen away constantly and, and fallen in love with their own ideas from the very first century. Some of these erroneous beliefs have had staying power. The best example is Protestantism. The reason the Protestant Revolution happened is due to the fault of both Catholics and Protestants. Catholics had let their church get pretty screwed up. Not in doctrine, once again, I say not in doctrine, but in a lot of other ways. Um, instead of trying to remain within the church and purify it, Protestants walked. We both cooperated in injuring and wounding the body of Christ, and those wounds are still visible today. That's why we're having RCIA. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy. It's a shame. But the fact is we're not one. We're trying to be one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in our book, in this lesson today, we see, you know, it says, are non-Catholic Christians guilty of separation from the church? It, you know, it says, one cannot charge with the sin of separation those who are who at present are born into these communities and that results from such separation. In them are brought up in the faith of Christ and the Catholic Church accepts them with, with respect and affection as brothers. All who have been justified by faith in baptism are incorporated into Christ. They therefore have a right to be called Christians and with good reason are accepted as brothers in the Lord by the children of the Catholic Church. And this is from your catechism. Well, I agree with that, but once again, was I, talk, was I mentioning people today? I was referring to the actual... Well, it sounded like you were talking to you answered that guy. Well, I was, I was referring to the Protestant Revolution of the 1500s when we both threw a lot of mud, mud at each other. Now, today... Uh, you have people who are, just as you were pointing out, who are brought up with a faith that is not the Catholic faith. They don't have exposure to Catholic ideas. They don't have really any opportunity to learn anything about Catholicism. And on top of that, if you look at the state of Catholic catechesis today, if they talk to Catholics, they're going to get an even more distorted version of what Catholicism is, with polls showing that 65 of Catholics do not believe in the real presence. Okay? That, you know, you've got people wearing things that say, I'm Catholic and I'm pro-choice. So how are people who have been raised in a good Bible-believing church, who are very devout, who know their scripture so well that they can run circles around Catholics, how are they to be blamed if they don't know the fullness of the Catholic truth? And the reason that they are not to be blamed is because their Protestant forebears in the 1500s and our Catholic forebears in the 1500s let that happen. That's the way it is. Now, that being said, uh, we believe that Protestants do not have the fullness of the faith. They don't. And that is because of our own sinfulness. Now, if I say that in an arrogant way, then I myself am committing a terrible sin. I'm saved. Huh. But if I believe that I've got even more of what has drawn you to Christ than you even knew existed, and it's not through any merit of mine, shouldn't I want to share it with you? That's where we're getting. And that brings us to the, to probably the most sensitive thing I'm going to talk about tonight. No salvation outside the church. Extra ecclesium nulla salus. Okay. This has been misunderstood. I could do an entire semester's worth of talk on this. Because this is usually put across as if you are not Catholic, you are going to hell. And if you read some papal bulls, you certainly get that impression. That is wrong. The church has taught that that is wrong. A lot of people, beginning with the earliest church fathers all the way down to Vatican II, have said that is wrong. If you, the most infamous example of if you're not Catholic, you're going to hell, is usually uh, mentioned as being the uh, papal bull Unum Sanctum, which was here a minute ago, 1302, 
1302. Uh, which brings us to this. Does anybody not like that? It's part of the Bible. You find that written in your Bible. It, the entire reading is, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What's my point? It's not enough to read the text. It is not enough to read this papal bull that says, no salvation outside the church. You must read the context. And the context of the papal bulls that say this is, I have found, and I've read them carefully today, they have nothing to do with Catholic versus Protestant. They don't even have anything to do with Catholic versus non-Christian. What they have to do is with a very complex understanding of church versus state that I'd need to give you a 30-minute lecture to to get you to understand. That, once again, you have St. Augustine saying how many wolves are there in the church, by which he means the Catholic structure, and how many sheep there are without of it. All right. There is baptism of blood, which means that you give up your life as a witness to the truth of the faith. Even though you're not baptized, what happens to you? Not even purgatory. You go straight to heaven. The martyrs? Yes. You're, there's nothing more to give than your life. There's baptism of desire. You're on your way to the Easter vigil and get hit by a drunk driver. Well, well, sorry, you go to hell. You weren't baptized. The church has never taught that. The church has condemned that. Father Feeney, who was a Jesuit priest a hundred years ago, was excommunicated. He was excommunicated by Rome because he said, if you're not Catholic, you go to hell. Okay, Father Feeney was later reconciled to the church when he got over his error. Um, now, if you hear the full truth, your conscience leads you to accept the full truth of the Catholic Church, and you say, no, then there's a problem. And I've actually known somebody like this. When I was in law school, very, very bright person, smarter than me, said, the reason I'm not a Christian, he said that if you, and this is, this is a real indictment of everybody here, he said, if you really believe in that, if you really truly believe it, then there's nothing else to do but to give everything to it, to mold your entire life around it. And I just find that too inconvenient, so I'm not going to. Find it what? Too inconvenient. Oh, no. okay. He was not saying that he just believed because it was wrong. He just believed because he couldn't be bothered. That's what no salvation outside the church means. Okay? So, uh, you need to understand that. And it's a very deep topic. But that is, that is and, you know, and some old line Catholics still believe that because, once again, they hadn't been taught right. Uh, love this story that uh, Billy Graham dies and goes to heaven. St. Peter meets him. And St. Peter says, let me show you around here. Takes him to uh, uh, past one room. And, uh, you know, they hear this, you know, this wonderful uh, you know, gospel lining. You know, you, you can tell it's a beautiful, beautiful scene going on there. Billy Graham says, who is that? And uh, uh, St. Peter says, oh, that's the AME Church. You know, have they got the best singing you ever heard? And then they move along and they hear this, you know, beautiful chanting. And Billy Graham says, well, what's, what's going on over there? Well, that's the Anglicans. You know, nobody does music the way they do. And then they come to, a, to another, uh, another doorway and St. Peter says, shh, they tiptoe past. Billy Graham's going, what's going on here? And they get on past, and he says to St. Peter, who's in there? And uh, St. Peter says, those are the Catholics. They think they're the only ones up here. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, when you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, you will be Catholic. You will see God face to face. To face. You will get the fullness of Catholic truth. Um, but you can get to heaven without being Catholic. If you're searching after the true and good, if you want to do the will of God, Thomas Merton has this wonderful prayer. Uh, Thomas Merton, who is a, uh, who, yeah, he was a Trappist monk and then a priest, and he said, God, you know, I, and you could tell he was in a little spiritual darkness at this point, that, and I wish I could remember all of it, I don't know if you're hearing me, I don't know who you are, I don't even know if I've got it right. Here's the key. But, 
I believe that the desire to please you in itself pleases you. And that is what we mean by baptism of desire. If you're doing your best by your lights, well then. I got, I yeah. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief, yes. That, you know, that, that Christ's sal saving grace is going to be applied to you somehow. Yes. I mean, like, you, you couldn't really distinguish darkness unless you had some light to contrast it with, right? So, where I'm mm -hmm. getting at, the term Catholic, was it always a term Catholic, or did it just come about after you had something to distinguish it from, the Protestants or whatever? Well, Protestants came. Yeah, afterwards, yeah. 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 Um, well, I mean, the, the first word of Catholic to describe this church we have was in 106, and the big heresy then was Gnostic. Uh, Gnosticism essentially said that matter is evil. How could Jesus Christ be God? Because Jesus Christ was a person and he was made of matter. And people, Christians, were following that idea into error and away from the Catholic Church. And as a matter of fact, the Gospel of John, which was the, the latest of the four Gospels, was written partly to clear up this idea about, uh, about Gnosticism. And the Word became flesh. And if you come to a Latin Mass, what do we do when that is said at the last Gospel? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, and so, Ignatius is warning, don't believe that stuff about matter being bad. You know, it's leading you into error. How can you believe in the third person of Trinity, or Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, if you've got that wrong idea? Well, I just thought yep. we were all just called Christians back then, and then they had the, 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 the process came along, and then they go, well, we're going to be this, and now we're still going to call ourselves Christians, but we're going to call us a different kind of Christians. You guys are Catholics. I mean, was that when the term actually came around, no. the term Catholic? No. Catholic is an old term, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I thought they, they used, used the term the early Christian. church when they said we're all Christians, but they said we are we are a Catholic church and we're all Christians in this Catholic church. Catholic is universal. universal. That's what I was talking about the contrast thing a while ago. My metaphor there was mm -hmm. I didn't know where it came. From. But you know, when you when, when you were talking about uh, Protestants saying we, we we believe basically the same, we believe the basics. We both believe mm -hmm. the basics. If you ask them, most would say what you were kind of saying a while ago, um, that we believe in Christ and the Bible and the Holy Trinity, and those are basics. That's what most Protestants will tell you, that Christians yes. are anybody that believes in Christ and the Holy Trinity and the Bible. Of course, mm -hmm. Protestants have a soul of scripture, which doesn't exist, mm -hmm. but um, that, that's another story. But um, that's, that's the basis, mm -hmm. is, is the Bible. Yes, but, but Protestants have generally taken away as opposed to adding um, and, and so it does lead to a lowest common denominator argument. And you will notice that Protestant sects tend to split off of each other, taking even more and more away. So, you know, the, the lowest common denominator is always going to be, well, we believe in the basics. And the Catholic will respond, you know, the fullness of truth. There are, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. There are many things that your forebears walked away from um, that you have never had an opportunity to know. Uh, we want to give it back to you. Uh, so that's, that's where the difference. And that's why a Catholic does not you know, like this lowest common denominator thing, because he sees the Protestant as simply denying himself some, you know, some of the beauties of the faith that way. When, yeah. I, when I first began to move towards becoming Catholic about six years ago, I went to see Father McDonald. We talked for a long time. And one day, we walked up to this little call shop. We had him call me, and he asked me, he said, let me ask you something. He said, you were a Protestant minister. He said, when I drive out here and I see this church that says New Life Church, or this church over here says Good News Church, he says, what do they believe? I said, I don't know. Well, he just started laughing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there are, there are, yeah. They don't know either. Well, there are 30, well, you got to be careful with that. I mean, there, there are some profoundly knowledgeable Protestants, of which I imagine you were one. But once again, I find as a teacher, all right, I was a good student in college, okay? I mean, I was. College is a test to see how much you can forget. If you don't forget enough, you have to stay there forever and be a professor. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I was an A student. I sat in the front, I made A's, and then I got to teach. I became a young professor of teaching, and I found out the hard way, hey, most of my students are not A students. Half of them don't even want to be there, much less know things. 
It's going to be the same thing in any church you go to, including this one upstairs. All right, most people you know, are not going to know all this stuff uh, in any congregation. Um, on top of that, once again, there are now something like 30,000 different Protestant sects. It is very hard for anybody to say, well, Protestants believe X. Well, which Protestants? And a lot of times I have found, from my experience with cradle Catholics, is that cradle Catholics know just about as much about Protestantism as good Bible-believing Protestants know about Catholics, which makes things even more complicated. Uh, you know, I've had a cradle Catholic get in my face and say, well, Protestants believe... You know, so, you know, right. Right. Yes. He was a Augustine monk. He was a Catholic, he was, he was a Catholic priest and a monk. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And when he found, when he, I think he found the kind of information, whatever, mm -hmm. he still keep a lot of devotion to the Blessed Mother. Yes. That is still believe in the real Christian. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of other things. Yes. yes. And then Calvin came along, and Zwing, Zwingli came along and said, you're crazy. And then Calvin came along and said to Zwingli, you're crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, then the Anabaptists came along and said, you're all crazy. So, yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's all true. It, it, and, and, um, and what you say about Luther's right. He never, he never lost his veneration of Mary. And mm -hmm. he never stopped believing in the real presence. Mm -hmm. um, and for a long time, he simply saw himself as a Catholic priest monk that got in trouble with the church. Yes. And then later in life, he... he, he um, I think he renounced his vows and stuff like that mm -hmm. for a long time, and that was after some other influence. But if, if you if you want to, and I know it's hard to separate, but if you want to if you want to read or find the purest um, exposition, I suppose you would say, of Protestant theology and doctrine, if, you know, if, you, if you're looking for something doctrinal, some kind of dogmatic Protestantism, you got to read the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. Mm -hmm. because that's the pinnacle of Protestant theology. And most Protestants owe a debt to Calvin, mm -hmm. a pretty big debt. Yes. So, oh, and by the way, if I could jump in right there, Calvin himself in the Institutes agreed with the proposition there is no salvation outside the church. Yes. Now, he had a different concept of what the church was. The church. Yeah. So, but he, he, he had that idea, too. So, yes. I want to step back <clears throat> to the church of the Bible. Um, you know, I'm a teacher. I've already got my Friday voice in those <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, okay. I don't doctrine as like this list of rules is happening and in our culture in the middle of Georgia. The Catholic Church is not this big influence that reaches everybody and everything. Mm -hmm. you know, it, the power of this church is not nearly what it has been in other communities in history. But you know, when we're talking like the Inquisition or the Crusades or you got Catholic. Don't forget Galileo. <laughs> Right, you got, you know, Joan of Arc getting burnt up mm -hmm. by the Catholic Church. Yeah. They were actually that, turning over to the English to do the burning. But, you're saying. Um, those, that is the Catholic Church teaching people. That is teaching by example. That is teaching by action and behavior. And the culture responds to it by believing things are righteous. Mm -hmm. Because they believe they're taught that by the church. Yeah. And so I think that sounds infallible to me. I mean, that sounds not infallible to me. That sounds like that is that is very fallible. That's that's very you know when so when a bishop to people to yeah. be wrong. yeah when a bishop burns a saint. Well, let me ask you this: Do you, do you believe that uh, that the Bible is infallible? I mean, I don't, I don't know. All right, let's take an earlier step than that. Church is what I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I know, I know. Let's take an earlier step in that. Do you believe that God could make the authors of the New Testament infallible if he wanted to? I believe he could, but I don't know how we would be able to interpret that and then one way or the other. Right. Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of Protestants, believe that the Bible is infallible. That sinful people like David who uh, got a girl pregnant and then sent her husband to the front line so he could catch a bullet and die and cover up David's uh, hanky-panky, who wrote the Psalms, God protected that kind of person from doctrinal error when he wrote the Psalms. 
or Moses, who really had an ugly temper, or St. Peter, who ran away and let Christ get crucified, and who then went on to write various letters. So people who believe that people like these, great biblical characters like these, were able to write infallible scripture, how is that different from allowing bishops today and popes teach infallibly about what that scripture means? If you believe in the infallibility of the one, it should be easy to believe in the infallibility of the other. But what happens is Moses is this great larger-than-life character who's dead and way back there, and our bishop today is somebody who runs around and drives a car and you know, eats McDonald's, and it, it, it just, you know, it's hard to get your head around that. So, um, and once again, the infallibility is only what they actually teach. Not teach by example, but actually write down, this is an article of faith to be believed that when Mary's earthly life was over, she was taken up body and soul into heaven. And there are actual figures of speech and language that have to be used to, uh, to meet that. Uh, example, Ronald Reagan, Saturday morning radio address when he's president. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I've just signed legislation that will end the Soviet Union forever. Bombing begins in five minutes. There was no bombing. Why not? Because he was not, at, you know, he was testing the mic and making a stupid joke. He was not acting in his official capacity at that point. There's a huge difference there. Um, okay, at what point are we assuming that God or the Holy Spirit, whoever, steps in like, when that stamp it goes boink, and then, you know, th that there's official, or... That's one way, yeah. I'm the Pope, and I wrote it down, well, then it's official? No, if, if the Pope says, let's do Chinese tonight instead of pizza. Um, yeah, there are, several, there are several ways. First of all, there are different levels of magisterium. For, for an ex cathedra statement, it's pretty much as you but say. It's ritualistic and administrative. Yeah. And yes, but God, is, but God is in the administration. On the other hand, if everybody has believed and everybody has taught for 2,000 years that Mary was assumed into heaven, and nobody's bothered to say it officially, but everybody's believed it, and there's never been any dissent from it, well, that counts too. And just to make sure that we know that that counts, the Pope says, all right, I'll put a stamp on it. But it was true before then. So, um, but if you go look over that chart of magisterium, uh, of the magisterium that I gave out, I think my first night, you know, you'll see the requirements. And sometimes it's very solemn. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you have to parse it out. Uh, it's what's called, uh, I, I like to compare this to what's called a seriatim opinion. That uh, if you read law, it used to be uh, 200 years ago, a court give, you know, the court gives a decision. And there are seven men on the court. Each one writes his own opinion. Now, they've all said reversed, so you know that they reversed the lower court. But why? Well, all seven give different reasons for it. Your job as a lawyer, when you're applying that law, is to read all seven opinions and add and subtract and harmonize and, and come up with the logical explication of what the court said, even though there is no the court. It's seven men writing seven opinions. Uh, John Marshall is the greatest Chief Justice the United States has ever had, largely because he did away with that. He came up with the opinion of the court. They wrote and spoke with one voice. And that held true until about 50 years ago when the prima donnas on the Supreme Court all had to get their own say in. So we're essentially back to seriatim today. It's very complicated, but you know, that's why we leave it to priests and bishops, uh, essentially, essentially bishops. So, we talked to someone about the teaching of the church being infallible. Yes. It has to have gone through this process to be included in the word teaching. Yes, yeah. It's not just, and that's that's the thing. That's another difference between Catholicism. Or it has to be the tradition. Yes, sacred tradition. Big T, sacred tradition. It is a tradition that priests don't get married. Is it a big T, sacred doctrinal tradition? Maybe not. Maybe not. So, but yeah. Thank you. Did really good. I now be a little hard headed. No, no, this, I am here to answer your questions. That is why I am here for it. So, was there a hand down here? I was just going to say, some of, them, some of them might help is that you know, there's always a truth and objective truth, and that doesn't change. And then they make infallible statements. It's not like they're coming up with a teaching or what they're doing is teaching. It's just they're stating what is true, and there's all these there's procedures that especially they have to like, 
there's protections. It's not just that everything. Else. And I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, the question about women being ordained. No one had ever raised that issue really seriously until about 40 years ago when Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan got rolling. And, and, that, yeah, and that's why you have an ongoing church that can correct new issues as they arise due to time and circumstance. No one would have thought to write in the year 100 and women can't be priests because it wasn't an issue. Now it's an issue. Now, there have never, ever been ordained women in the Catholic Church. So you can say that that's probably part of the deposit of faith. Then, to make things clear, 1994, Pope John Paul issued a statement. I, I, was it an encyclical or an apostolic letter? But it was called uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis. And he said, I need to make this clear, just so everybody understands. I'm saying, as Pope, I don't have the authority to tell the church to do this differently than it has been doing it for 2,000 years, i.e., limiting ordination only to men. I can't change that. And that's, that's not what people think of when they think the Pope. The Pope can do this. Pope. No, he, he, the Holy Spirit informed him that he was limited by sacred tradition. And he couldn't change that. Uh, and then people said, well, was he just saying that, or was, is that part of the deposit of the faith? And then Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, that's part of the deposit of the faith. That's what he meant when he wrote it. So, Now, there are still Catholics, or Catholics who identify themselves as Catholics, and I even know some Catholic priests who say, no, that's going to change. Well, what happens when it doesn't? Will they follow their own preferences into error? Can't be more Catholic than the church. Other questions? Um, yeah. When he said that, was he saying that he himself didn't have the authority or that the Pope's the role of Pope? Like, he, said the, he said the papal office does not have the authority to change the practice of limiting ordination because it, it absolutely disembowels the, the theology. You pull that one little thread. Um, and, and the whole idea of the, the Mass is the wedding feast of the Lamb is completely thrown out. And Jesus so. Christ even said, Jesus Christ has to come down mm -hmm. and change it himself because I cannot change it. Right, He's, right. Yeah, there's, there's no new revelation going on here. It is simply understanding the revelation that we have more fully. Remember, the apostles looked Christ in the face. They saw God face to face. He revealed everything about himself to them. There isn't anything left to reveal. There is no new revelation going on. Yeah. Uh, remember now, the church is the mystical body of Christ. And because it is the mystical body of Christ, the, the Holy Spirit has to guide it. And he would, he would prevent men from error, the, you know, the bishops and... and he has to yes. That. Yes, because we're all fallible human beings. Yes, only limited, of course. Yeah. So, you know, if you ask the Pope what's the square root of 19 and he gives the wrong answer, that's yeah, not a lot yeah. of that swirl. Yeah, fallible, but not the peck. Yeah, and that's, that's good. Let me put this. Yeah, that, yeah let's, let's use two highfalutin terms. And the reason we use highfalutin terms is that it usually condenses a whole lot of complicated thought into one term that you can throw around relatively easily, that the Pope is at certain times infallible. The Pope has never been impeccable, and impeccable means free of sin. The miracle is that God can speak infallibly through human beings who are sinful. That's where the miracle comes down. And that's an article of faith. I cannot prove that to you. Just like I cannot prove to you that God exists. You know, you either accept it on faith, judgment of history, um, or you don't. Yeah, even Matthew, mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are, they're men, but, you know, mm -hmm. when they wrote the Bible, they're protected by the Holy Spirit. So. Yeah, so I, I'll stay as long as you want. I see some of us are needing to get up and leave. Do you want to do a closing prayer? And then I will stay up here for those of you who want to stay or, or have time to stay. But well, let's officially end.